be talking about two different things. One is I'm going to be talking about the research from the Microsoft Security Intelligence Report and what we found in the last version of it, which was version 24. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about what we can do to modernize the Security Operations Center using something called data gravity. So let's get started with the Security Intelligence Report. How many people have ever even heard of the Security Intelligence Report from Microsoft? OK, that's great, a few hands. Um, it's similar to the Verizon Dibber, the data breach uh, incident report. You probably have heard of the Verizon report, right? Many, many people have. Um, we do a report like that, but we actually take our own data. And obviously, Verizon takes their data. We take our data. Uh, and a lot of our data, I'll explain where it comes from, but we have a different set of, of data and different view into what we see going on around the net. It, and we put this out once a year. And this is actually, it takes us a full year to go through the analysis to find the right stories because we see a lot of information at any given time. But just because you see one spike here or one spike there, that doesn't mean it's got statistical significance. It doesn't mean it's actually a trend. So what we do in our blogs, if we see a really big change in a tactic or a technique or a new piece of malware, we'll write it up immediately. But then when we come to the end of the year and we do our full intelligence report right up, we try and find some really big narratives in order to give you guys a, a view into some of the big, big changes that are going on and hopefully to help you have some insights into how you can address them. So in version 24, the, we had ransomware versus cryptocurrency, phishing attacks. Is anybody looking at this and going like, oh my god, phishing, why? Why are you talking about phishing? Isn't it you know, almost 2020? Haven't we, had, haven't we done it to death? Well, uh, we, we've all heard about it. Is it solved? No, it's still the number one attack vector. So that's why it's coming back up again. And then supply chain compromises, which I know we had a full, a full uh, keynote on earlier. So where do we get our information? What, what is our information from? It's from Azure. It's from around our data centers around the world. And, and for the office productivity suite, that also provides signal. And the total signal that we get per day is about 6.5 trillion security signals coming through our, our data centers. Now, it, that doesn't mean that there are 6.5 trillion attacks. It, there can be multiple security signals inside of an email, for example. It could be the attachment of the email could be uh, malicious. If the email is from someone that, that purports to be from a company that they're not actually from. So there can be a number of different signals, even in one email. But the total is about 6.5 trillion. I've heard we're working on a new number. But as you can imagine, at a company like Microsoft, we're always extremely careful about what we report out. So right now, this is the reported number. But I think it's going up. Um, next time, we, we present that. The other thing that was we, we have our data centers around the globe. They're manned 24-7 by hundreds of security experts. And that means that they're actually manned uh, you know, in three shifts. So we don't do a follow the sun. We actually have them watching the activity around the world 24-7. Uh, and then we bring a huge amount of this information, those 6.5 trillion signals. They land in something called the Microsoft Intelligence Security Graph. If you've been out to our booth out front, uh, you've probably seen a picture of this. But the, the interesting thing about it is that in addition to those 6.5 trillion signals, we are looking at things like 450 billion authentications every single month. And by seeing that kind of data, we start to see the way that the attackers are moving and shifting. So it was by looking at the data in the graph that we realized that they had moved from brute force kind of attacks. Right? If you want to get into somebody's, somebody's account, the traditional, the older way is a brute force attack. You get a, a dictionary attack. You just kind of throw every single possible combination of password at that account, right? That's something fairly common. To combat that, a lot of organizations, what they did was they started to, to do a timeout. You know, if you get three or five authentications wrong, you enter the wrong password, we're going to lock your account, which kind of creates a denial of service opportunity. But, um, you know, it's always a trade off in security, right? So, by looking at these authentications, we actually started to see a different kind of attack. It was a password spray attack. Is, you guys know what password spray attacks are? Password sprays are when you take a known set of email addresses. Very often, companies use a standard email address 
So at Microsoft, it's first name dot last name at Microsoft.com. Boom. Everybody has my email address, right? But you don't have my password. Now, so attackers, what they were doing in password spray is that they go to, they look at all the, the different potential emails that they think are going to be at a company, and they use passwords that are fairly common or fairly well known. So one, two, three, four, five is, is one that's, we can't have that at Microsoft because we have strong password uh, protect, you know, uh, requirements. But Seahawks and variation of Seahawks is something that we started seeing thrown against Microsoft accounts. And why, why would that be? Anybody know what, what Seahawks means to Seattle people? That's right. That's one of the sports ball teams in, in Seattle that's very well loved. So that password spray. So by looking at, why do we look at authentications? To see things like that. And um, we also, you might notice, take in information from Xbox into the security graph. You'd be thinking, well, what do governments, what do enterprises care about what's going on in a gaming platform? Gaming platforms are actually very highly attacked areas. And in some gaming platforms, not on Xbox necessarily, but some gaming platforms uh, have been used for money laundering, for example. So you can get a lot of interesting signal. And actually, some of the original uh, attacks that were going on in, in IT the very, going way, way back, they were wares based, right? What, what were some attackers, what was the first thing a lot of attackers wanted to do? They wanted to crack the key to the games that they wanted to play so that they could distribute copies of these games freely. So gaming, you can get a lot of information. So a lot more goes into this, but this just gives you a bit of a, the size and the scope of what that security graph has in there. And by looking through that information, by looking through and talking to the t our teams, our Microsoft Mystic, the Threat Intelligence Center team, by talking to our, our uh, response teams, our detection and response groups that go out when someone's been attacked and help them to recover. These are all the kinds of different pieces of information that we bring together into this report. So the big, the big news out of this one was that we saw a 60% decline in ransomware. That's pretty good. I mean, that's, that's actually meaningful. Now, will it, could it go up and down? We're actually seeing ransomware sort of bubbling its head up again. But we had a 60% decline. It's pretty rare that we see positive news like this. You know, it's, it's like, oh, there's more vulnerabilities. There are more attacks. They've got more, more you know, devices that they're using to throw a, a denial of service, right? But we, this, this decrease is actually pretty good news. And why, why, did we, why do we think? No, we can't say definitively why there is a decrease. Right? The attackers don't say to us, we stopped sending out ransomware because. But keep in mind that ransomware, cybercrime is a business. It's, it's projected to be a $1 trillion business right now. So why would, they, why would a, a cyber criminal probably stop doing something? Because it's not working. Right? Why wasn't ransomware working? Because of you. <laughs> Because of you, because we got better. A lot of organizations got a lot better about patching, about segmentation, about backups, all of the things that can make you, if not fully immune to, to ransomware, far more resilient and far less likely to have to pay that ransom. So that's good. And I think this is, again, I know like, you know, phishing, ransomware, I'm, I'm not coming up here and telling you like the most, like, something you've never heard. But these numbers show that when we do the basic hygiene, yeah, it's not the sexiest thing, but boy, does it can really create a big difference for us. So um, let's, keep, let's keep doing it. Let's keep doing our really good basic hygiene. Um, some very America-specific uh, ransomware. And so I've presented this in, in Latin America, and there was like mm, Canada, Canada and the US. Because Canada and the US have the, the lowest encounter rates on ransomware. Again, most likely because, most likely, again, we don't know. The attackers don't tell us exactly why. But most likely, it's because we're using legal uh, licensed versions of the operating systems. We're keeping them patched. We're doing good backups. And we're um, segmenting our networks as needed. So um, now, while ransomware was going down, the attackers got to make money somehow. So they found that they were easy. It was, they were making money at cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency mining is, is kind of a, you know, it's almost like the 180 of ransomware, because ransomware couldn't be louder. It gets on your system, and it locks everything up, and you can't do anything at all. So you're just stuck. 
and you have to pay the Bitcoin or you have to re-image that machine. Cryptocurrency mining is the opposite. It's really quiet. What they want to do is they want to use your resources to do the computational work of the, to do the mining for the cryptocurrency. So they want to be actually fairly quiet. You might notice your fan go on if it's on your own device. If there's, there's an attack and they're doing a lot of mining uh, on your server farm, for example, if it's on-prem server farm, if it's, or in the cloud, but if it's on-prem and there, you see a lot of mining going on in, a, in your, one of your server farms, what would be one of the tip-offs for that? Heat. Yeah, I mean, it would actually get very, you start seeing hotspots. That happens in the cloud, too. If, you, if, it, if a company's been attacked and someone's trying to do coin mining in their tenancy, you might actually see a hotspot um, show up. But so the, the coin mining has gone up. Um, and one sort of really interesting note is if you ever want to see if there's a, a, a correlation between profit and, uh, and seeing things like ransomware and seeing things like coin mining, if you'll notice when the cryptocurrency is at its highest value, that's also when we were seeing the highest encounter rate of the crypto, of the coin miners. What they look like and how they get onto the systems, very often they're, they're browser-based. One of the previous speakers in this room was talking about CMS, content management systems, and how these can be ways to infiltrate um, a, a, an endpoint device, for example. Um, can also be a, a way to get coin mining as well. So, um, but, but not the CMS often itself. It can be a plugin, for example. Um, or, you know, compromised, injected, hidden in, in multiple layer, layers of the iframe. And in this one, here's an example uh, where you get a warning. And this is in French, although I don't know if it was targeted at Canada or if it was targeted at France. Um, but uh, here it is. Oh, no, I think it's France, actually. Um, so here it is. It's, it comes up. You get to a website, and it says there's a problem, and you can't get out of it. What's it doing in the background? It was coin mining. Another example of where you see coin mining is people go to gray sites, say they want to see, like, the latest Avengers movie. And you shouldn't see it if it's not, if you don't go to a, a legitimate site and you pay to rent it and all that. But, but they, they get somebody to come to their, their gray site and they've got a movie. You, it's actually the movie. It's a pirated version of the movie, but it's the movie. And while you're watching it, they're doing the cryptocurrency mining in the back end. Um, sometimes I'll get asked, well, hey, I wanted to see the Avengers movie and I got to see it for free. Is that really a bad thing that they're on my system? Yeah, it is. You, don't, you do not want to have attackers. The attackers, the fact that they could get the coin mining malware on your system means that they infiltrated your system. So even if it's, if it's not bothering you, quote unquote, it still means that the attacker's on the system. So you don't want, to, you don't want that. Um, where are the, the findings overall? Uh, we're actually pretty low here in the Americas region. We're lower than global for coin mining encounters. And again, the lowest encounter rates are in the United States and Canada. So, so we're, we're doing good. OK. Phishing. It's not new. <laughs> I know that. But we looked at 300,000 different campaigns for phishing in 2018. There were 8 million business email compromise attempts. And we're really rapid at getting out. You know, so it's like we're actually really good. We've all been kind of trained, right, as we're kind of like lab mice. We get an email, we got to respond. We get an email, we got to respond, which is how we do our work nowadays. We're very, very active in responding quickly. But we have also are very active in responding quickly to phishing, too. So it was about 20% of users were clicking on the malicious link in the first five minutes. Not because they were like, oh, goody, I'm going to go and get the, the malware because we're just really good at being very fast and very effective at the way that we work and we respond now. Um, phishing, the messages increased. They're still going up. So what, you know, what with ransomware, right? Ransomware was going down probably because it wasn't as effective. So if we're seeing phishing continue to go up and we're seeing increases in campaigns, what is probably on the other side of that with the cyber criminals? It's successful. Right? It's, pro it's working. This is still the number one way that folks are getting in. So again, I know this isn't the most exciting topic, but we, don't get, we, it, we haven't gotten it right yet. And it's going to be people, process, and technology. 
It, there's going to have to be, we have to keep training our users. And you know, I hate when I hear like that, that carbon-based life forms are like the whole reason we have a problem. You know, it's like, oh, it's the, the, the idiot on the other side of the keyboard. I mean, let's not forget that we, the human beings, created all of this. So we can yell about the car, you know, say, oh, the carbon, we're the carbon-based life forms that created computers, that, cre that wrote the code, created the network, created the systems. So we created them. So let's not throw away every, you know, okay, there may be some people that are just kind of hopeless, but a lot of us, I believe actually all of us, if we get the training and we know what's a problem and what's a fish and what to be suspicious of, we can be the first responders. We can be the ones that alert, that click on, especially if you've got an, an, a mail system that's got the ability to report immediately if you, if you sus suspect something. We can actually engage our users to be better at being our first line of defense against phishing. That's going to help us. The other thing is technology. And uh, Microsoft went and we looked at, at how good we were at catching fish about a year, two years ago. And we were not as good as we wanted to be. We were missing not just against our competitors, but missing more than we felt was, was right you know, for our customers. Right? We, need to, we need to be the best we possibly can at this. So we reassessed what we were doing and what we were looking for in, in terms of, of if something is, is a bad piece of mail. And we came across four different dimensions where we were able to increase our accuracy significantly. And the, the reason that we're showing this, right, because this means right, any a competitor can look at it and go, oh, well, that might be a good feature. That could help us. True. But it's, it's really important that all of us understand this is not about the competition with one vendor versus another. This is about trying to get the most, the safest uh, mail systems out there. And we're all interconnected in our mail, right? So the better that we all, because we're all on one side, we're on the good guy side. It doesn't matter if you work for this company, that company, you're in this country or that. We're the cyber defenders. So sharing information can help us all be smarter. So that's why these are the four things that we found really helped a lot. Uh, multi-factor authentication. I know in the last talk it was mentioned that you know, multi-factor authentication can be, can be gotten around. Um, it, it, in some cases it can, but multi-factor authentication, we've seen in some instances, in some context in, in, in our space, we've seen 99% reduction in attacks. So multi-factor authentication, very, very, very helpful. If somebody's got your, your credentials, they're trying to password spray, right? If, they, if it's, you've got multi MFA on, they're not going to be able to get in. Um, DMARC, DKIM, SPF, doing things like querying. Is this, the real, is this a real domain? Is this a domain that's been around for a while? If this is a, is a real trusted domain, did that MX, did the mail exchanger that sent that email, is that the one that's supposed to be sending the email? So going through and doing these additional checks to make sure that you've got validity. Um, and doing detonation a couple of times. So checking a link as an email comes in, that's great. That's good. So you check the link. You, you identify, is it going to a malicious site? No, it's not going to a malicious site. It looks all good, right? But what happens after that check? What do a lot of attackers do? They wait a few minutes. And after the few minutes, they turn that site, they turn it into a malicious site, a site with drive-by downloads, or it's going to be some other that may be a malicious site, even if it's just going to harvest your credentials. So it's also important to, to check not just the link as that email comes in, but also to check on click. Because whether it's five minutes later or 15 minutes later, it's important to do that second check. And that these kinds of activities, so whatever you're using for mail hygiene, if it's not catching as much as you want, you know, those are some ways, you know, these are some of the, the features and functions that you can look at um, talking to your vendor about and saying, hey, are you doing this or are you doing that? Because I think we can get better about catching fish. And then supply chain attacks. So I know we had a keynote on this, um, but we are definitely seeing this. Now, in a, in a hardware world, obviously supply chains get very, very complicated. But also in the software world, we have a, a supply chain. That discussion about CMS and, and content management systems, a lot of the places where you're seeing attacks or, or, or vulnerabilities being introduced is through plugins. 
not because people are terrible. Some plugins are, are written on purpose maliciously. A lot of plugins are just, they're great, they add a lot of functionality, but they haven't been written by security experts. They haven't been tested by security teams. So always be cautious of what you're using in your environment. This definitely goes for things like DLLs, for libraries. Um, the other places we saw uh, the, the uh, malicious activity or malicious content was in containers. So be, always be very careful of where you're getting those pieces that you're using within your development lifecycle. Whether you're pulling down a container from a community site, or you're using a library, or you're using a DNL, or using a plugin, make sure it's coming from a trusted space. And if you can, do your own scanning on it before you deploy it widely. It kind of seems like a little bit obvious, but based on the amount of, of malware that we were seeing coming in through this vector, um, it's something that, while it may, we may already kind of know it, not every company is doing it. So that, that's the, the summary of what we saw in the, the version 24. What's going to be coming up? Um, we're not quite sure what, what we're going to be highlighting in the 25th version that's going to be coming out next year. However, I can tell you a little bit of what we've been seeing that's interesting. So remember, again, we want to look at all the data for a year and then give you the very best top level um, analysis. But you know, just to show you a little bit of what we've been seeing, we've been seeing an uptick in these living off the land kind of attacks. So these are fileless malware. And fileless has become very popular with attackers because it's pretty hard to identify. Rather than putting a, an EXE, portable executable, that can be scanned and you can say, oh no, this is bad, I know it's not here. If you're using really heavy, you guys use heavy whitelist blacklist, if you've got a really heavy whitelist blacklist approach at your company, um, you know, a, then an EXE would, it would, that's, that's not on the whitelist, right, it's not going to run. So fileless malware, what they do is they run on known and approved executables. So a really classic example would be a malicious macro running inside of Word. Word is known, Word is trusted, it's probably on a, on a whitelist, but by running the macro inside of it and making that be malicious, that's how the attackers, they evade detection. So in the case of Astaroth, they were using Wimic um, to run a script, and that was where the attack came in. So Wimic is, is, is approved and was trusted, but by using a malicious script through a trusted EXE. So these are, these are tougher for orgs, and orgs to, to prevent against. I mean, you can't just look for a hash the way that we were, you know, we've done in the past, but that doesn't mean that they're impossible. There are absolutely ways to detect this kind of malicious activity in large part by looking back, moving from just looking at hash and looking at behavior. Because it may be a trusted executable, but the behavior of that malicious script is not acceptable. So by focusing on behavior and using machine learning models that are very behavior based, we're going to get better at finding these kinds of attacks. And that's actually how we found Astaroth. Some other things, ransomware, yeah, unfortunately it kind of crept back and we're seeing it again, but less so with the, the full, you know, pay me the sweet, sweet Bitcoin and more being used in a couple different ways. One is this destructionware. So trying to wipe out their, their, their path, you know, so there's been an attack wiping out what they've done by just getting on the system and, and, and destroying all of the evidence essentially. Also distractionware. So say you've got a company and they're, they're known, they're publicly, they've, they've announced we're going to put out our earnings on X day, you know, Thursday at 4 o'clock, right? If you are an attacker and you drop ransomware on, that, on their systems Monday and Tuesday, especially if you can get them close to the financial services systems, you may not be interested in getting Bitcoin to pay you for the ransomware, which you may be most interested in, is causing a distraction so that that company that was about to, to announce its earnings has now have to question, do we have to go look at our systems? Is everything really okay? Is this reporting actually accurate? So looking at these ways and distraction, and classic distraction, it's like the prestige. If you can get the security team focused over what appears to be a threat, it might be possible to do some activity on the other side. Um, IoT, IoT, and the convergence of IT and OT, this is becoming a, a place where I think we're going to see more and more attacks going on as we have the operational technology side and the, the, the informational technology side coming together. And then attackers 
guess what? We've been really successful with ML and AI and security, and attackers are figuring that out. So they're doing their own, their adversarial perturbation. They're trying to change the date, to change the outcomes from the models, and in some cases, figure out how the models are, are doing their weighting so that they can change the, the assessment. So uh, just a quick note on ML and AI and how I think we're going to get better overall as, as organizations going forward. It's, we, it's really going to be about machine learning. There's, think about that 6.5 trillion signals. Can you imagine, even with all of the security experts at, at a company like Microsoft, can you imagine humans getting through that every day? We need a lot of humans. And we know there's a cybersecurity skills gap. I mean, depending on which report you're hearing, it's like between you know, hundreds of thousands to hun you know, tens of millions. But there's, let's face it, who here has absolutely everybody, you're all fully staffed up, perfect, you got everybody you want on your team, and it's great. You know, most of us are, most of us have some sort of a hiring issue in security, right? It's hard to find enough of us to do the jobs. So we, we need the machines to help us to get through all this data. And we're seeing some really promising solutions coming from, the, the, from these. So in, in who's here, who's heard of uh, Petya, not Petya? Right, most of us. Okay, want to cry? Yeah, almost all of us. How about Bad Rabbit? So far fewer hands went up. Bad Rabbit was actually the third piece of pernicious ransomware that came out in, in 2017. But Bad Rabbit didn't hit the news because as, as widely because that one actually was stopped, and it was stopped because of machine learning. It was encountered on a system. Uh, it was reviewed by the local, the lightweight machine learning on that device, but um, that lightweight uh, machine learning was not able to define that it was definitely needed. It was, it was malicious. It needed to be blocked. So it went up into the cloud, and into the cloud you can have much heavier classifiers and machine learning models, and that's because you have a lot more processing power. I mean, you've, on your laptop, do you want, or your, your critical servers, do you want to have machine learning models that are taking up all of your, your processing power? No, you want to do your work, right? So that's why on the endpoints, it's fairly lightweight. When you get into the cloud, we have these models that are running on purpose-built systems, so they can be, have much more power. So when Bad Rabbit got up there, and ultimately where it was detonated, it was defined as definitely malicious, needed to get blocked. That took about 14 minutes. Emotet, which is a, uh, oh, here we go. Emotet, um, which is a, another, it's a Trojan, uh, was encountered in February uh, 2018 in North Carolina, but the machine learning model on the endpoint was able to determine that it was bad immediately. And it was actually, this, this particular model was looking at the portable executable. Because um, there are different models. Some, some models are good at detecting behavioral, uh, you know, uh, Anomalies, some models are looking at, at, at PE kind of attacks. So in this one, it was actually stopped in real time, and over the next 30 minutes, we saw over 1,000 systems that were also protected, and that was in milliseconds. So um, this is what we need, right? We need to be able to stop the attackers as quickly as possible, and machine learning and AI are really going to be powerful, powerful tools um, in, this, in this fight. So some quick recommendations. The security hygiene is really critical. I know it's not the most fun thing. You know, ML and AI is really cool, but uh, security hygiene, but your configurations, if you think about the news every time you see a, a problem that's uh, well, often when you see problems with, with customers that have losses of, with their cloud provider, it's around things like configurations, security hygiene, keeping the backups, making sure that you've set your access control properly, and training your, your folks to be part of the solution, to be aware and act. And then to take a look at what you're doing in Security Operations Center. Because SIM technology is pretty old. Classic SIM technology is about 20 years old. So looking at, at a SIM that's going to be a little bit more modern for you. Because one of the big problems with SIMs right now is that it's really hard to get the signal out of the noise. Who here? Uh, manages the SIM, writes rules for the SIM, manages the SOC. Just a couple? Okay. Um, so those, those rules tend to be pretty hard to build well, and they're very static. So 
when something changes on the network, when an attacker changes their tactics or techniques, is the SIM, is that rule necessarily going to find it? Not, not, not necessarily. And in fact, a lot of times, one of my favorite quotes ever was um, someone who was in charge of rating SIM rule said, it's like a box of knives. You know, it's like, it's really easy to get hurt and, it's, and, it can, and to not necessarily accomplish what you want with it. So as we look at the SOC and we look at all the signal that you're getting about attackers and systems, um, there's you know, definitely, there's a problem with trying to find the signal in all of the noise. And it's getting compounded by the fact that we've changed the architecture significantly. The original architecture in a security operations center was around one company usually. And we had that perimeter. We've also had the zero trust conversation, right, with the CTO of Canada talking about zero trust, which is great. And it's, again, that perimeter, not perimeter. If you look at SOC, SOC is having a similar challenge. It's not, where, where's, your, where's your information? Is it all in the data center? Certainly not in, in one data center. When I first started using computers, they were, they were actually hardwired, right? The terminal was wired to the, the actual, the, the, the mainframe. So we're not in that kind of a world anymore. We're, also, it's, we're walking around with all, of our, with all of our data. And we've got it in multiple clouds, too. There's a good chance you've got your data in a few different clouds. You're using a SaaS solution. You do even know where that SaaS provider is using what cloud they're in. So we've got to figure out how do we bring, how do we understand all this data and bring it together in a way without just doing what we've done traditionally. And we think something that might be really cool here, and this is a, this is a, on the, the, a little bit on the theoretical side, um, is to, to respect the law of data gravity. And data gravity is a concept that was introduced by um, Dave McCrory, who was working at VMware when he, when he came up with this. But he posited, look, the more data that you collect, it's gonna, get, it's gonna have a gravitational pull. And it's gonna pull services and apps to it. And then somebody, and it's gonna be compounded by if you have an inability to, to support latency. So if it has to be really fast, right? And latency, which in security, right, latency is, is a big problem for us. The faster we find the bad guys, the better. If they're, they're sitting around for too long, then they've got the opportunity to take our data. So latency and bandwidth. If bandwidth is squeezed for time, you're also going to see more services and apps coming to that, that data gra gravity ball. So we thought that's really interesting, what Dave came up with. And this is his, I think somebody challenged him and said, well, could you do that in an equation? And so that's what that equation is. It's just what I just explained. That's Dave's equation for data gravity. Um, so, but we, some, some colleagues, Sean John and I at Microsoft started thinking about, well, could this help us with the SIM? Can we, given the problem that we've moved 20 years past the original SIMs, and we've got our data in so many different areas, and there are going to be, right, there are different clouds with different data balls. Amazon's going to have a lot, there's a lot of data in AWS, there's a lot of data in GCP, there's a lot of data in Azure. Can we start to, instead of doing what we've traditionally done in a SIM and a SOC environment, which is point all of the logs into one place, and then you go through, then you write all your rules, your hard rules, and then, then you, you start to, to go through the, the information. Could we start getting a little bit better about getting signal and alert and information and doing some of the analysis earlier in the process where that data resides? And can we also get better about, and this part now, so that, that was the theoretical part. This is the, this is, now I'm going back to actual. Can we also get better in SIM by breaking out of that traditional rules-based problem. So a traditional rules-based engine is kind of, it goes down this attack path that's fairly linear. When you look at, and we saw the kill chain, and I think it was Renee's keynote, she had the, the standard Lockheed Martin kill chain, right? We kind of think about, here's how the attacker gets in. They send the fish, they download the malware, the malware does something, they then get access to a server, they exfiltrate the data. And it's very often that they do go in that kind of a, you know, a linear path. But they also know that they we're watching them on those paths. So they're getting better and better about not going on a, a straight linear path and sort of very quietly moving around in systems. So traditional rules-based engines, what they do is they kind of look at that path. And they look and they also assess things based on what's high risk. If something is low risk, if an activity looks low risk, well, that's okay, it's probably not gonna lead to anything. 
or we've never seen that kind of activity lead to something, so let's just put that away, and we're going to go down the traditional path of it. We, we normally see it this way, so we're going to watch for the, for the pathing and get down to just a couple of prioritized attack incidents. But again, attackers are getting really smart, and they're getting very light touch, and they're doing things that have been not been seen before. So it's really time to go from a static approach to rules in the sim, and we're going to get better at catching the bad guys. We start moving to a more machine learning graph-based approach. And using the ability uh, for probability, right? being able to say, hey, what's the probability of, even though this is a pretty low, low issue right now, you know, it's that activity, it doesn't flag, as it's definitely, we've seen it lead to some damage before. It may be, as you go through all the different probability models using Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations, you start to see, oh, you know what? What we thought wasn't necessarily going to be an attack, it could potentially lead to an attack, one that we might not have even seen before. So now you don't need to write the rules for every single attack you want to catch. You leverage the machine learning to help you identify if there's a possible path through. And we've used this um, for our own systems. And we've gone from, a with AI-driven detection, we've gone down from you know, trillion, billions of events, right, the 6.5 trillion signals, gone down from the signals down to reducing it to just a few suspicious candidates. And then using that probability, using a graph-based approach, getting down to 90 true positive cases. So instead of just having to say, I know this one attack path, I'm going to write a rule, it needs to get information from this device and this device, and that means that there's a problem, that sends an alert. You start using these graph-based probability, and you say, well, what if? What if the attacker pivoted from this activity to that activity? Could that then create a loss of information? Could that then be a problem with our data? So doing that, moving that along that path, and then getting down to just a few. Now, the interesting thing is that um, machine learning is not going to do it all for us. So it'd be kind of nice, right, if I get up there. Like, it'd be great if I could say unsupervised machine learning is here, and it's basically going to teach itself everything. No, you still need to be very supervised with your machine learning with the data that goes in and also looking at the, the, the um, findings and classifications that come out. But we also found something really interesting was that when you combined rules with machine learning, that you got the very best outcomes. So by going just with the rules, we had 2.8% logins were suspicious, which doesn't sound like that much, right? 2.8%, you're like, hey, you're doing pretty good, right? Um, but if you've got a billion logins per day, 2.8% 2 is 280 million suspicious logins. That's a lot of people time to go down that search. So 2.8%, mm -mm, not good enough. But when you put the, the machine learning together with rules, and why are rules still important? Because rules can give us that really good baseline. And also, rules are based on what matters to you. So the machine learning model is looking at the probability of there's going to be an attack. But you also know what's right for your business. Nobody knows your business. Nobody knows your, 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 what you need to do for your organization the way you do. So combining these rules with machine learning is when we got down to uh, less than 0.1%. And when I first had this, I, for some reason I had the wrong number, and I had 0.01%, and one of our data scientists was like, no, you know, because they're so, like, and I was like, well, so he's like, no, <laughs> it's totally wrong, fix your slide. So it's fixed. Um, but yeah, uh, so it's a very, I think 0.1% I think is very impressive, um, but it's not 0.01% it's not as I had improperly had. But anyway, so getting down, so you can see that's where you get to a really good, a really good outcome is when you bring the two of those together. So we think going with machine learning rules and as data gravity, and, and as we look at, at ways, what can we do where our gravity is sitting? Uh, what can we do to maximize our, our, our visibility? Uh, at machine learning really does help us to reduce the manual uh, steps and the errors, and then also help the humans because, um, 
we need help. We're overworked. And we're starting to hear reports from the field about you know, SOC analysts getting PTSD and not being able to, to, uh, you know, to, get the, to find what the problems are to respond to the alerts because they're starting to get so overstressed. Right? They, we've got alert overload. So trying to get this all, make, make it better for people. And to make sure that we can speed the mean time to identify and mean time to contain as much as possible. So MTTI is mean time to identify, and, and MTTC is mean time to contain. And these, the time to identify and contain actually has a real dollar value assigned to it. Has anybody ever heard of the Ponemon Institute? No? OK. A few? OK, so it's, it's run by Larry Ponemon. And what's awesome is they're a dog-friendly company. So if you're ever on the phone with them and you hear barking, they're just like, oh, yeah, the dogs are playing. Uh, but they're dog-friendly company, incredibly smart data analysts. And they do once a year, because it takes them the whole year to gather the data, they come out with something called the cost of, um, uh, the cost of a data breach. And this cost of the data breach uh, report is, is put out. Usually, I think IBM usually sponsors it. But they put a dollar value on how quickly it takes to identify and contain the attackers and what that means per breach. And it's usually um, in the millions of dollars range on average. And the way that they do their data is they do averages. So they throw away, usually what, the, the, what you're finding in the cost of the data breach from Ponemon Institute aren't the big, the big breaches that are in the news. And the reason is that they would weight out the average too much. What they're really trying to do is to get to a number that a, a, an average large size company can apply and you can see that by getting your mean time to identify, mean time to contain, mean time to remediate down, you can literally save in a breach situation potentially millions of dollars. Um, so again, the SIR, the Security Intelligence Report, it is free. You can download it at Microsoft.com uh, SIR. And we also have what's cool. We used to do this thing where we would take all those account rates around the globe and we would publish this all in the Security Intelligence Report. So you got, it was like a phone book, if anybody remembers. For those that remember the phone book, um, it, was, it was like a phone book, um, which some of our customers absolutely loved, and some did not because it was kind of a phone book. Um, so uh, what we have now is we have the short version of the SIR, which gives you those, those high-level insights that I was telling you about. But all that data is still available to you. So if you want to say, uh, what does it look like for encounter rates in Canada? You can go, we have an interactive version of the SIR up at that site, and you can say, just report out for me for Canada, or just for the North American area, or just show me ransomware encounter rates, just show me coin mining. So we still have all that great data available. It's just it's not published in the document as it was. It's now available for you in an interactive site at that, at that URL. Um, also, whenever we find something, if we see something, we say something. You know, we, we don't want to keep information about what an attacker is doing uh, private once we know that there's, if it's, if, when it's time to share, we share. When we see malware, when we see IOCs, we put them out. Um, and one of the best ways to get that, that up-to-date information and some really nice technical explanations of how and why we find things is at our security blog. Thank you so much for your attention.